Well, hello, everybody. My name is Robert Davis, and uh, <clears throat> I'm extremely honored to be present, actually, in the continuing interview with Nicola Christie. Her bio is um, really one of the most amazing pathways, um, and really the reason that I've asked Nicola to be involved in the launch of, really, Frontier Theater's first interview series. Um, I feel she represents um, one of the cutting edge, uh, I call it creodes, um, or evolutionary scouts that is uh, just beautifully present to uh, offer us glimpses of, uh, of opportunities, um, along with challenges as we move into the future. So uh, thank you so much, Nicola, for joining us for the second part of the interview. Oh, thank you, Robert. Thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure, truly a pleasure to be here. I do feel honored. Thank you. Always, always. So the last time we talked, there was um, a lot of points brought up <clears throat> in reference to uh, uh, your new book and um, the process of world shift and kind of uh, looking at the landscape. Of, of some of the pieces of your work. And I guess I would like to lead into this interview and just, uh, I guess, ask the question on your vision of the present in a, in a crisis opportunity sense. Um, what is it that you see in prioritizing uh, action steps uh, to perhaps accelerate uh, what I believe is a necessary consciousness leap uh, that will then afford us, um, I think, mobilization towards climate crisis uh, aversion and uh, many other elements of our society, the 5G system and uh, how we're being kind of squeezed from all of these different levels so what would be a little short course, I guess, that you could offer our listeners um, that would allow them uh, some insights as to tools, as to what they can do immediately and on a daily basis, perhaps, to, uh, again, uh, elevate the insights as to how to participate in the change that is occurring around us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like quite a, an expansive question and one would, from my perspective, I can only respond from my perspective, one would imagine it would be quite a complex and expansive um, response that's needed. Um, but you see, in my life, and in fact, I'll start right now by saying that um, anybody that's uh, watching this interview, please, this is all in response to your question, Robert, please be wired up by ethernet. Because if you're wired up by ethernet, you're not harming anyone or anything in your home, including the plants and pets. Um, and if you're wired to wired to the house, you're not harming anything in the environment. So I think we start there which will lead me into what I want to say, which is um, we need to be more responsible, response, able, responsible. And I think I mentioned this in our previous interview, but we'll probably go in different places with it. So by the very fact that we become informed, we become aware of what our actions, our choices, our decisions, our preferences, how they impact the world within our homes, our own bodies and the world. When we become more aware of this, we, we start to educate ourselves more on this. It puts us in a place of different choice. So then we come into a place where we say, okay, every choice that I make now, if I make it mindfully, if I do it from a perspective of how does this harm myself? How does this harm the beings around me in my home, uh, in my environment, in the world. 
And if we, every step we're to take in this world, were holding that awareness in mind, we already would be creating a major shift. So for example, we make sure that we live in this sort of video technological age where we all like to see each other um, and experience a transmission because when there's certain interviews with certain beings, it's not just the words that they're speaking, it's the actual energetic transmission. So they think they're looking at the person and just enjoying, you know, okay, it's nice to see this person speaking, but what's actually happening, not in every case, but in some cases, there's actually an energetic transmission taking place. So on that level, it's like all the words, you know, the mind is very busy with the words, but the heart, the felt sense, the soul, the being is actually absorbing a different kind of communication altogether, a kind of a communion with a source energy. So this is what, what I mean when I say it's certain individuals that we can, we can look at on video and we are beginning to have a, what I would call a source communion with those beings. So we live in this technological age. We know, as I think I mentioned in our last uh, interview, that we're moving into the age of Aquarius, into the Uranian age. And the Uranian age, as we move out of the age of Pisces, which was all about spirituality, uh, religion, of course, um, creativity and illusion, delusion, addiction. I mean, all these things, the shadow and the, the light side of Pisces, we now move into this new Aquarian age. And fundamentally, it's the age of the humanitarian and the mm -hmm. age of technological advancement on an unprecedented scale. So part of that technological advancements we, advancement we know is our enjoyment of watching videos, streaming videos, and partaking on whatever way we receive from that. So this is why I say, let's be wired up on Ethernet to, keep, to, to, to create, a co-create a safer world, because this is what it is. When we're wired on Ethernet, we are creating a safer world instantly by that choice. Now, the headphones I have in are 99% um, radiation free. And um, uh, these, I've got these particular ones are actually given to me by a company called GIA Wellness in America. Um, and that's the only way I'll, I'll wear headphones. Otherwise, I, I won't wear them. So this is what I'm saying, our choices. Mm -hmm. Your question, Robert, everything comes back to the individual. It's just not constructive even to first look at how do we change it out there how do we create a model um out yeah. there it, the, the model is ourselves i could say more but i'm pausing because i just want to give you space to come in well thank you <clears throat> i i totally agree i totally agree the the individual <clears throat> is the you know, apex of the question as to change. So there's so many varietal, varietals of individuals, as you know, on the planet, uh, from many different star systems and uh, from whence they come. Um, <clears throat> so orchestrating something that's heard by different stratas of consciousness, um, I'm always fascinated with uh, the message and the necessity for receptivity. Um, how do you see, you know, that unfolding amidst the need for responsibility with the various stratas of consciousness we see on the planet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Well, if we look at the various stratas, um, we kind of, we go from the, what I would call the high vibrational, high frequency, high consciousness, uh, awakened strata community, and what is happening at that level, um, and how beings in that field can take mm -hmm. more and more and more and more responsibility. And we know it kind of filters down. And I think I did mention in our last interview that you can, sorry, my earphone keeps falling up, um, you can... Um, you can just walk along a high street now and the evidence that was let's say our reality 20 years ago of all manner of iconery spiritual iconery or icon, 
iconography um, is everywhere in what I call the, the 3D world. So we know that something is filtering through. And I guess in a way, it's also about beings that are here who are the messengers, um, uh, cross-generational. Um, mm. they, they come in with this remit of what strata they are, they are specifically communicating with. So I can only speak for myself. Myself is, my strata is that the awareness that comes to me with all of the experiences I've had, because I'm kind of, I know we all are in this world, but not of it, but I can say it's quite extreme for myself. It's quite hard for me to keep myself really in the world. It's probably why I live on a mountain. But the point is, yeah is from my perspective is to be able to take this this direct communion and communication that comes to me via the higher dimensions via my higher self anyone that knows me knows that i don't read anything i never read any books articles i haven't since 2009 because i need to keep keep this clear channel for what wants to come directly through me from higher self from source etc but my, um, let's say, area of expertise is to be able to take incredibly complex, advanced information about what's going on and where we're going as a, a planetary civilization, as, as an Earth even, and have the capacity to communicate that, again, across the board. So I can write for, let's say, the, the most um, awakened mind, and I can keep it just purely in that language, or I could write for a newspaper article that would go out mm -hmm. to the mass consciousness. So I think that we have um, a community of um, consciously awakened beings who are positioned in society and around the world in the specific places they need to be in these transitional times, these times of great challenge with these incredibly auspicious times i mean exciting times because <laughs> the possibilities that face us as a humanity and as a world are the like of which we've never seen before we just have to rise up to receive what these are and um and be able to receive how we actually do that so that's that's kind of where I feel my own speciality is, and we can see, as I mentioned again before, various beings on the planet who are taking primary positions right now to influence the mass consciousness, including somebody like Greta Thunberg. And I know I mentioned this in our last uh, call that, you know, regardless of the machine that's behind her yes. and the, yeah. um, the controversy that's being created, she herself as far as I'm concerned, is a highly, highly awakened and evolved being who has come back here at this time to bring this message to the world and the world is listening. So yeah. we all have our positions. Mm -hmm. Well, excellent answer. Yeah, it was, a, it was kind of, uh, yeah, I was curious because it's, it's a question that is not easy to answer and you, you, you know, just came up with a brilliant solution as far as showing how different individuals have seeded along the different stratas that mm -hmm. are then available to communicate per that strata. And that's, that's a, yeah. You know, it leads me to something else, Robert, which is something I'm feeling very strongly about. It's an article I want to write for sure. And it's what came to me in a meditation is the new generation of we in capitals capital w capital e the new generation of we rising and i really felt into that i thought okay what am i receiving here what's happening and what i came to understand is that the 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 template let's call it that because it's not old paradigm it's the template that worked in the old paradigm to bring us to where we are now was very much a single cell unit out there working under their own name, under their own steam, like all the big names that we know now, even Deepak Chopra, Greg Braden, Bruce Lipton, Barbara Marx Hubbard when she was here, Irvin, Irvin Laszlo, and all these beings that were here to blaze a trail. And now we have this new generation of we rising. And mm -hmm. 
the new generation of we rising is not to do it by themselves. And now we've moved into a phase of our history where we need to do this together. And it's nothing new in a sense of, you know, we all know that, you know, if we're doing something on a, a macrocosmic level, then we're going to, we're going to, going to make more progress. Um, but nevertheless, it's this sense now of the only way we are going to navigate and negotiate our way through this critical window of time that we've entered. And those that have gone before, the, the trailblazers, have opened up these avenues. And now we stand. So I almost see it from an image perspective that we're standing with this vast horizon in front of us. And we can see these trails you know, single trails going out infinitely in front of us where the, the trailblazers have gone. And now there's this, there's been this mass incarnation since the, really the late 1930s, but I think the 60s, the 1960s, it really started to happen. This mm -hmm. mass incarnation of awakened beings. Um, and now is our time. Now our time is to stand together and we move forward as one energy to, um, to take up our positions, our next positions, and then the generations that come behind us will be taking up their positions in terms of what we, this grand sweep forward into our future as a humanity, as a world, uh, they come behind us and they'll, they'll be doing what their unit is. So it's also from a conscious evolutionary perspective, it's um, we, we, we each generation, and when I say generation, I'm talking about from 90 to you know, six months old right now. We right now are the generation that's here on this planet at this time. This is our remit. But we're moving also without question. Again, the whole thing of the awakened beings coming in. We started off with the light workers who really, as I say, started mass incarnating from 1939 and then it just went off the scale in the 60s. Um, and then following the light workers was the crystals. And everyone was talking about the crystal children. And mm -hmm. then there was the rainbow children. And then the ones yet to come are the diamond children. We have those scouts coming in right now because there's always scouts that come in ahead of the mass incarnational wave. So at the moment, we're kind of we're a, a community of light workers of crystals of um, rainbow and we're moving into the diamond because ultimately that is the next great age that we move to we're not even back into the golden age which is the age that was prophesied by all of the ancient indigenous wisdom cultures to be the next great age of humanity post 2012 but beyond that age is the diamond age and the diamond age is the age of the future and it is, it will take place in the age of Aquarius. But whether it happens in 500 years, 1,000 years, 200 years, because the Hopi talked post-2012 about 1,000 years of peace, that 1,000 years of peace was coming. And this was central to their, uh, their wisdom that they understood about the future way, 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 way back when, you know, mm -hmm. 2,000, 1,000 years ago even. So the Hopi... I, I believe that their prophecy, which is uh, one of the core central key prophecies for humanity moving forward, suggests to me that I, I sat and said to myself, okay, well, what happens after a thousand years? You know, why are we going to be experiencing a thousand years and then what? What happens then? And in my mind, that's when the diamond age comes in. And that really is an, an age that's never, ever existed on this earth before. The golden age has but the diamond age hasn't. Do you relate at all to the Yuga system, the Satya down to the Kali and Dwapara? Oh, yeah. Different, because when you're speaking in 500 years, there's thoughts that we're in the Dwapara age now, uh, moving towards the Satya phase, which is the golden, golden age. And, yeah. and, you know, time frames are in that period of time of 500,000 years moving into that. And I think it's, you know, so I, we had some questions on the interview. Uh, some people asked me, they were a little confused about the timelines you were speaking of, those four or 500 years, about living your dream. 
you know, when we're ab absolutely in tune with the process of our highest nation and, um, you know, co-experiencing that with, uh, you know, the brothers and sisters and so forth that uh, um, are, are uh, embodied at this point in time, plus all the hierarchies as well, because we're plugged into so many stratas in an omniverse context. And that's what I'm excited about, having the omniverse element as our playing board to moving from, you know, almost, you know, in a dimensional sense to a point of looking at the hierarchy or angelic realms of the divinities and uh, combining that with extraterrestrials of which we are uh, connected intimately as far as our source in, in our past. And having all of that come up, um, that's a dimensionalizing experience on its own to basically have, have that as our expanded reality context. And uh, that, that's exciting to me to see that come about. And, and teaching the sacredness of life, the, you know, the sacred birthing process of all of these new souls. This is the sacredness of creating life and then the birthing of it, the gentleness of it, creating a new culture that way. And, um, you know, it's, it's all there. It's a matter of, I, I, I'm sure you're one of a few people that they are actually you know, doing this in the sense of looking at that organic whole system of which all of these parts are components and just offering it up in, in, in a uh, perhaps a clear um, uh, type of, um, of information system that is, as you mentioned, uh, an article for a newspaper, you know, mm -hmm. just offering it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and what I'm reminded of actually as you're saying that, um, Robert, I mean, firstly, when it comes to the questions about the ages and so forth, and the Kali um, and Sutra and Yuga and all of this, is because I don't read anything. I, I don't know anything. I've heard about the, the Kali, Yuga, etc. But I can't, sure. I'm not a, I can't talk about it because it's not right. within my field of knowledge. Um, but having said that, with the, the Grand Ages, and, and the time that we need, um, it's not to say that we're not going to experience um, the peace and the, and the joy and the humanity that we're looking for to, to, to manifest on this earth. We can do that within 50 years. Mm -hmm. But it's all dependent on the, as I said in the last interview, the maturation of the mass consciousness. So those that are more mature in their consciousness, more awakened, will be experiencing that in their lives right now. You know, there are those of us that are already living that peace. We can see in the world what's going on, but in our own worlds, it's all about peace. And it's all about a dedication, a devotion, a commitment to every step we take is one that is in peace and is safe and is non-harmful. Um, you know, that, that saying, first do no harm, it's like a mantra for those who are consciously awakened. So the truth is that there are those of us here already who are living that reality that I talked about that may take 200, 400, 500 years, 100 years. However, for all of us to be living it as a global consciousness, as a global community, that is dependent on the, uh, the maturation, the psychological um, maturation conscious evolution of humanity and that's why it's a it's an unknown it's an unknown variable right now because we don't know what leap of consciousness is going to happen next year 50 years 150 years from now something could just happen and it could just change the consciousness in that moment on this planet so from my perspective I can't really put a timeline on it and that's why I gave that kind of long sort of yeah. 500 years even. Who knows? Because if we look back at the last 500 years of history, we can ask ourselves how far has humanity consciously evolved, yeah. psychologically integrated and spiritually awakened in the last 500 years. And we can say there's a portion of humanity here that have done that. 
And to me, these are the star seeds, mm -hmm. the enlightened beings, the beings from the future, the beings from other dimensional realities who have come here to help humanity, the world and the earth herself actually, begin to, to come to midwife them into mm -hmm. this new, um, new earth reality, this new conscious epoch that we're moving towards. But these for me are beings who have come from other places to help humanity en masse move itself forward but humanity on mass itself how far has it consciously evolved because again we go back to the whole subject that there is no time so when one even says 100 200 300 400 500 years actually there's no such thing as time it's just an evolving process for humanity i love the term <clears throat> midwifing it's a great great term for for the process and kind of reminds me of Pierre Terre de Chardin and the process of ultra hominization. Ultra hominization as we move towards omega point, omega point. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it seems to be the process and one that is so fascinating for me because I, I feel like I was born with it. You know, I was kind of born with it because I, the, the different teachings and the understandings that I've, I've been able to come to have been uh, very magical and um, all leading to basically, a, as I've always used the term star culture, you know, that we are a star culture and that, that realization and all the different teachings through time have led us up to this moment. You know, so that's, that's, a, that's a very powerful experience. And, uh, you know, speaking of the now, it's that ability to flip a possible future into mm -hmm. a possible presence mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the maturation process that you speak of, 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 of the souls. And uh, that's why I'm always interested in asking the different teachers that I speak with as far as tools. Is there anything besides no wine before it's time in the maturation process? Or is it something that can be accelerated uh, by different tools and techniques? And or I think you brought up a very good point you, about the softness of the peace, really the grace of the invitation for people to participate. It, they need to feel safe. You know, That's we're going it. into this huge huge mm -hmm. universe of multi-universes and um you know it's 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 a big concept so to feel safe and loved and cared for in the invitation i i think is really important yeah mm -hmm. for sure for sure do you want to continue on this or is there something else you wanted to ask robert just so i don't keep this no i'm space? i'm completely i think mm -hmm. it's perfect with whatever you're saying or whatever you feel to say at, at this point, there's so many ways we could go. I want to make sure that, you know, you voice, you know, where you are and, and or what you want to convey completely at, at this, mm -hmm. at this moment. Um, you know, there's the, the whole element of, you know, healing the wounds, you know, such a powerful, mm -hmm. powerful necessity and, you know, looking at the different methodologies of how can people heal their wounds. I know hypnotherapy of which I practice and so forth and understand different models. Uh, you go to past life, and interlife and, you know, the uh, postnatal yeah. biographies and, you know, all the way through, um, you know, in, in, that, in that context. Mm -hmm. Well, if we're looking again, you see, uh, where is our spotlight right now? You know, are we looking at the consciously awakened community or are we looking at the world as a whole? Because we're looking at different methodology for different arenas of society at this point. So what, for example, we might say to someone on the consciously awakened path and they pretty much know where they're going with that anyway is entirely different to what we might say to somebody who's, let's say, the, the least awakened level of consciousness on this planet in this world at this time so again it's it comes for me it comes back to trusting at some level that the well firstly the conscious community um consciously awakening and consciously awakened community is going in the right direction and the energies that are 
uh, created by that kind of consciousness are filtering down. And in the sort of lesser awakened and least awakened areas of society, we're looking at a different way to get through. Um, and again, where's the focus there? Who's focusing on that? Now, I actually think and feel actually that the, um, the 5G crisis, um, and that this is what it is, it's actually a crisis, um, is a great gate that's opening for humanity in terms of a wake-up call. And personally, I call the whole 5G crisis a wake-up call for humanity. And I think I did mention this in our last interview, because what does it take to get through to the collective? And as I spoke again in the last interview, um, in the chapter I've written in the new book, you know, the, um, the role of epigenetics in composition is looking at why is the world in the state it's in right now? Why is what is going on in the world going, in, going on in the world as it is right now? And why is it the same story that just repeats again and again and again, century after century, millennia after millennia? It's the same story. It's just in a far more exaggerated way now than ever before. Um, and this is because, you know, we can liken um, the collective to the individual is that the more that the individual has done the work on themselves, the more they have healed the past, the more they have healed their historical wounds, the more they open to the true being that they are, the true path that they're meant to be walking in this lifetime, and the more they open to the, their capacity to fulfill their, their greatest wishes and desires while they're on this earth. Um, so when you look at the individual in that way, you can also say, well, let's superimpose this onto the collective. So mm -hmm. the collective itself has historical wounds. The collective itself carries karma. The collective itself has forgotten who it really is and why it's really here. Um, mm -hmm. And even where it's really from. And these are kind of key components in my own message. Remember who you really are. Remember why you're really here. And remember where you're really from. And then the added component to that is, and remember where you go when you, in quotes, die. Because if people on a mass scale realized and understood that there's this beautiful reality that lies beyond this earth that they're going to, that level of awakening alone would help to anchor that reality into this dimension. So we have all of this going on. And so we say, okay, the collective is also carrying these catastrophic wounds of the past, and it doesn't seem to know how to heal them. It, it's got caught in this kind of repetitive cycle, this repetitive loop. And it's not really known how to get out of that. And so, as I say, we're moving into this new age of Aquarius, which is a phenomenally supportive for a great change to happen moving forward because it's also the age of the humanitarian um, and then of course we have the crisis that they're going on now uh, from extinction to um, the, the climate the climate crisis which some people question um, is it real is it isn't you know is it not is some of this made up and is it another distraction I mean there's so many conspiracy theories out there <laughs> that you know it's like okay well it, what do we believe? What do we just have to know what we feel? We know that there is something going on, but then how much of that is to do with the grand evolutionary cycle of the earth herself? Mm -hmm. So yes. we have to keep bringing it back to ourselves. We have to keep saying, okay, there's this going on, this, 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 this. It's just a litany of issues that's going on that we're dealing with. And it's, it can be overwhelming. And, and many people are overwhelmed by it. There's some terminology that's just been coined. I can't remember what it is now, but it's a specific terminology that's now been coined. It's not eco-stress, but it's something like that. <laughs> because so many people are, are feeling yeah. depressed, you know, well, feeling helpless, course. powerless, overwhelmed, because it's everything has come up now sure. um, yeah. to the surface. So I think we just say we trust at some level that the collective like the individual is on its own healing journey um, and we know with the individual that the the deeper we go into the healing journey the more healing is to be had but in order to go deeply into that healing journey we need to become more conscious 
And for me, that's where the focus is on the mass. So 5G comes in mm -hmm. and 5G threatens. It's a major threat on health on every level. Uh, it's, it's a major threat in terms of the pollinating species. It's a major threat on the um, developmental fetus, the fetus of um, infants, toddlers, babies, the elderly, people like ourselves. It's a major threat. So this gets the attention of the mass. This is going to come in and get the attention of the mass. You know, in terms of empowering itself, because again, when we go to the epigenetics, of conscious evolution and we look at the disempowered mass the story of the mass the his story and her story going way back even before the his story um, but the story let's call it that the story of the mass is of disempowerment is of um separation is of power over and so it's again when I talk about the mass being caught in this loop and they're just repeating the same patterns over and over and over again, decades, centuries later, nothing changes. It's because it's caught in this loop. So by um, recognizing, recognizing that we, we have got caught in history as a mass culture, um, at least those of us that are more consciously awakened can look and see, okay, this is what's going at a sort of a, a macrocosmic level. This is why we're not getting anywhere. And then out of nowhere in comes 5G. And 5G, as I say, is the awakener. And it's an opportunity for people to empower themselves. Because nothing will move and galvanize a collective faster than a threat to its survival, a threat to its health. And for me, this is the awakener. So do you think uh, people are <clears throat> um, conscious enough to understand that and somehow maneuver around all of the major marketing that they're being bombarded with as to the value of 5G for whatever it's being valued as? So that's, uh, I see there's a lot of, there's a polarity there at this point. And uh, I'm optimistic that with information that, that you're offering that can be, you know, distilled down to really recognizable bites by people that don't understand now, but presented with a clear logic as you can present it, um, you know, can make the right decisions. I think it's going to take time, Robert. I think what's happening right now is there's a, um, for the, the, the mass with the 5G scenario, it's, to me, it's more about, again, the, the phase of conscious evolution of the, the macrocosmic in the respect that it's having and it's going to have an encounter with empowering itself against authority. This authority that's imposing this specter onto humanity mm -hmm. and it feels like it's a first major step for humanity to be able to say no and to challenge and to actually <clears throat> achieve so i feel that by galvanizing together as a collective and it's happening all over the world because um i'm also part of a, an international round table and we call it the counter 5g international round table and it, we, we meet specifically from all over the world every tuesday afternoon to discuss the global scenario to do with the 5G situation mm -hmm. and steps moving forwards. So it's globally, it's happening globally. And to me, this is just the rumblings, the rumblings that's happen, happening within society so that the individual and the collective can gain a sense of um, this imposition by authority, which is its history, um, mm -hmm. have, beginning to have a different relationship with that. So again, it's not really a case of what can be done in the short term to really turn this around and change it. It's very much what I call a long curve movement of coming out of this uh, oppressed, suppressed, repressed, uh, imposed um, history uh, as a society and moving into a different phase. And it's not quite that simple. Of course, we know that there's so many other components to it, you know, even with Extinction Rebellion, which is huge in the UK. Um, this sense that, again, you know, all the people that want to tear it down, you know, well, you know, at its roots, it's this, it's mm -hmm. that, it's the other. 
And it's almost for me that's become incidental. The very fact that this energy is mobilized and moving and it's, it's being mobilized and moved by genuine people who are mm. not associated with any particular telecommunications organization or it's some kind of, you know, imposition again by global authority. It's a setup, you know, it's all, all these things that are being said about it, you know, that it's, um, it's actually a, another part of the plan by um, the global authorities. But you see my feelings around it is, but they, it's, <laughs> The image that came to me the other day, I was thinking about it, it's like they scored a home goal. I think it's home goal or own goal. I don't know anything about football, but is it own, O-W-N or home? It's when the side scores in their own net. They go against themselves. And that's what I feel with authority. It's, yeah. I'm going to say home goal, but I've probably got it completely wrong. It's scored a home goal with 5G. Sure. It's scored a home goal with crisis change. Extinction Rebellion and all these kind of organizations, it's, it's stung itself in the foot. Because if I just say this piece, the intelligence of where consciousness has arrived, has superseded the intelligence of global authority. Global authority is still operating under the same mm. old templates, separation, dualism, control, manipulation, abuse, and so forth. But the intelligence template that has anchored into this, onto this planet via the um, awakened beings that have come here, it has superseded the, um, the old template, let's say, let's call it that, of the, um, the, the patterns and the, you know, the impositions by global authority. So now global authority are up against an intelligence they've never come across before. And unbeknown to them, they don't really recognize it, but unbeknown to them, they're beginning to score these home goals. <clears throat> it sounds like it's time to set up an alternative UN. Yes. The type of alternative UN that's, you know, got a kind of a functional, um, I've always felt if you had five people in a row <clears throat> that understood how to do something, the world would be changed instantly. Five people, I have always been given that number for some reason as far as manifesting something to happen where somebody could actually do follow through and create something. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's an amazing time. It's an amazing time. It's an amazing yes. time. Very so the so. numbers of, of countries involved in the 5G system now that are, um, you know, basically denying access or whatever to that system, where, where is it as far as numbers? I mean, who's, who's moving forward and saying, no, we don't want 5G? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, most of the countries at some level, but the ones at the foreground that we most discuss and we, we, and, and we most represent are, of course, the USA in a mm -hmm. big way. Australia in a huge way. Um, there's a, an amazing, amazing lawyer there called Raymond Broomfield, Broomfield who has created this incredible template for everybody across the world to follow and to take to the local authorities. Uh, it's a legal type template and he's found all the loopholes in the law where you can, there's, you can kind of uh, present a case where your, your health is at harm, the health of your loved ones is at harm, even by your neighbor's Wi-Fi. If you choose not to have Wi-Fi in your own home, but you know, on the thing that where you, you, you sort of, it comes up and it shows you what, I don't know what those things are called, what do they call them? Uh, where you see where the white, and you have to put the password in. I can't remember what sure. they yeah. anyway, So you see one of those, if that's showing up on your Wi-Fi in your home, it's, it's harmful to you because it means those energies are reaching you. <laughs> they're, um, every, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Everywhere. It's massive. Absolutely. <laughs> but you know, you've, you've, you've got, You've got places in countries saying no. There are um, places in Australia that have said no to it. Um, Totnes has said no to it in, in the UK. Mm -hmm. Glastonbury has said no to it. Froome in Somerset has said no to it. Slowly but surely, as each town mm -hmm. is implementing, I think they call it the precautionary principle, is implement, implementing this precautionary principle, yeah. um, as each town does it and sees that, oh, okay, we don't have to have this. We could get it stopped. At the moment, it's stopping it temporarily. The next move is to find out how do we stop it on a permanent basis. 
crap. Yeah. <laughs> um, but again, you know, it's like a friend of mine who is, um, he's really in 3D. I can feel I'm going to cough. <coughs> um, he said to me, you're never going to change anything. You know, mm -hmm. the trillions of dollars have been invested into this. Right. All the satellites up in space have cost trillions. Mm -hmm. It's never going to be stopped. But I don't, I don't believe that. Because when you have, as I've said before, it sounds idealistic, 7.5 billion people saying no global authority would crumble but you don't need 7.5 billion people mm -hmm. you maybe even need just like a couple of billion people but enough people that say no and that whole old paradigm structure of politics and authority etc it just crumbles the big mm -hmm. question is what replaces it and this is why I talk about this long curve, because in this yeah. long curve, it's not just about working out, well, how do we, what do we need to do to change things? It's at the same time is, well, what do we do when, not if, when things change? And we need mm -hmm. to have those structures in place. So this is what's really important. Conversations really need to be happening at a, a, an instrumental uh, place where new, I don't mm. want to call them political, but <clears throat> new, um, new evolutionary, let's call it that, new evol evolutionary um, templates uh, are established so that when we move through that long curve and the old system crumbles, which it will, mm -hmm. what is going to replace it and how does it replace it in a way? Because the second in the past that people have come together, no matter how altruistic, They've come together to create something healthy and functional. The ego's coming. I'm going to give an example here. This is an important, important example to suggest. Is mm -hmm. that I live in Rennes Chateau, well, not in the village itself. I live on the next mountain, St. Ferial. So you, you kind of have Rennes Chateau here, and then you go down a mountain, there's a little road here, and then you go up this mountain, and this is St. Ferial where I live. Now, over in the Chateau, it's, it's very alternative here where I live. And um, a community came together, the foothill of Rennes Chateau. Um, and they were a community of about 20 people who decided that they wanted to buy some land, buy a building. I mean, it's, it's a common story that goes on around the world. We know it. But this is just an example I've had a direct experience of. And the whole purpose was to really create this new earth, new consciousness community that would be a, a template and to practice that template and how that could actually work in the world. So this is what they did to cut a long story short. They did that. They all pulled their resources together, bought this huge piece of land, this majorly big house, uh, like a mansion, outbuildings, etc. And within two years, the whole thing was just completely broken down. <laughs> what, had, what had happened is, as usual, the egos came into play because it always has to be the alpha male the alpha, alpha female, you know, the, um, the, the one that wants to be the leader. And, um, and so it went on. And this comes back, Robert, again and again and again yeah. to the self. Because if you put 20 people together in that kind of situation who have done the work on themselves, well, who have left no stone unturned in themselves, mm -hmm who have psychologically integrated, consciously evolved, spiritually awakened, and have positioned themselves genuinely, not just as a concept, but genuinely in a place of love in themselves. So everything they do is about love, mindfulness, the way they talk to someone, the way they view someone, the way they commune with other people, the land, nature, animals, insects. The whole life is a dedication to love, genuinely. Put 20 people like that together who know how to communicate, not from hierarchy, yeah. but simply from how much they love each other. And that communication because of the love is so pure that this is when you can create a new template. So it comes back again and again and again to the work we do on ourselves, the healing we do on ourselves, 
looking back at our history, looking back at our childhoods, looking back at our ancestors, thinking about our karma and saying, this has to dissolve. It has to be healed. It has to be, you know, in order to heal first, we must feel. In psychosynthesis, we talk about identifying in order to disidentify. So we need to step in to the wound consciously to then be able to transcend it. And only when we've done that en masse, will we be living in this, I would say golden age for sure, but on our way to the diamond age. And it needs to be done individually and it needs to be done collectively. Is that process detailed in your book? So someone would just follow those, yes. those sequences and the healing um, again, is it, as you see it, does it come about through just the self-realization process or are, are there tools again that, you know, how does one truly heal, um, you know, by just observing, you know, the pains of the past or is there some other process? And I know it's going to be individual per individual, but, um, you know, that's what I'm really, really looking for if, if there's any insights as to you know, how we do actually heal something. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's not either or. It's and, it's both, and it's beyond. Um, I mean, I don't want to sound cliche, and I genuinely don't feel this when I'm saying this. For me, it is truly about love. Mm -hmm. There's, again, a person I know who is so embedded in 3D, <laughs> so embedded in it and has not gone anywhere near their history and their history is a difficult one right. and so they, they they operate under this kind of unconscious um entrainment with what i see as a slavery system um that is you know um the um the matrix and so that this person is very reactive angry about this, reactive about that, you know, violent thoughts about this, um, disrespectful mm -hmm. thoughts about that, and so forth, and it goes on and on and on, including towards myself. But my wisdom says to me, keep coming back as love. Just keep staying present as love, not as a concept, but as a genuine state of being, which after all the work I've done on myself, which is like, I don't know, 20 years, maybe more, of this deep leaving no stone unturned in my own self to right. have cleared yeah. everything I have cleared. Sure. Um, it, it puts you in a position where you can say, okay, keep coming back as love. And what has happened regardless of what this person has said and done. And some of the things they've said and done to me would have people's mouths drop open with shock, not physically touching me, but just threats and right. things like that. Um, oh, okay. To keep coming back as love. And I slowly but surely noticed over a period of years, something started to soften. I wasn't giving advice. This person was completely closed off to any kind of psychological mm -hmm. um, conversation. In fact, if I even <laughs> dared to go near there, it was another major oh, reaction. And certainly <laughs> so closed off to spiritual, you know, it kind of sees me as an alien, really. But I thought, yeah. it's okay. It doesn't matter. What matters is just being present as love and let's see what happens. And that love truly, truly, if I could give the details, which I won't, but that love, I saw it soften this person. And now, all these years later, this person's attitude has completely changed. Mm. So in answer to your question, Robert, we can say, okay, well, fundamentally it's love. Gravitate towards love, wherever love is. Um, and then we can say, okay, well, some love that's love, all love is love, but some love of it isn't quite as functional as other love. So, um, <laughs> you know, where do we gravitate towards there? But I, I, I just feel it's, I think it's, a, if, if the individual can say, can recognize that they're actually living in pain when they're, they're living out of alignment with the natural order of things, the way things are meant to be, yeah. I think but, that's the first step. But again, do they go to a psychotherapist? Do they go to a hypnotherapist? Do they go to healers? I mean, I think it's all and and more. And I think our generation, and when I say our generation, I'm talking about the 
tens of thousands of thousands and thousands of light workers, of conscious evolutionaries, as I like to call us now. Um, I think we have our role, and our role really is not to exclude ourselves and make ourselves exclusive as a community. Okay, here we are, we're all together, we're all on the same table. Yes, there's still lots of things to work out here, but we know where we are, and there's that, that dimension over there. It's actually about integrating into that dimension and bringing the awareness, the consciousness, the frequency, the vibration, the love that we are, taking it into 3D and then just being present as love. And that in itself, if enough of us are doing that, is going to change things. So even though I live up on this mountain, I do spend a lot of time going right into the heart of 3D and I do my practice there, which is all part of our practice as consciously awakened beings in this dimension at this time. <clears throat> hear ye, hear ye. Hear ye. I love the rainbows around you, Robert. I don't know if you can see them. It's all these little no. rainbows. Uh, uh, Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, thank you. Thank you for your, for your insights. And <clears throat> really, I, I, I love your your process of explanation because it, it comes in waves, you know, it comes in waves and, and, you know, you, you covered these facets, which when you say something, I'm just wondering about another facet. And then a little bit later, you just answer it naturally in, uh, in your process. So I, I thank you for that. I'm, that's a, it's a wonderful experience. Um, so, in closing, as, as always, if there's uh, any, anything you would like to close with and leave uh, our listeners and, and viewers with, uh, um, again, uh, your, uh, your, your energy and your, and your heart. Yeah. Well, thank you, Robert. Um, i just give that a little bit of thought for a moment, okay? Just see, see what I'm with. Yeah, I think we come full circle to where we started and what I, I started with, which is, you know, your question, I talked about how expansive it is and how, at some level, how complex the answer could be. But mm -hmm. in truth, the answer is so simple. And it just comes back again to love. That if we can align ourselves in love, if we can open ourselves to love, if we can remember and that's the truth, really. Remember that we are love and that any distance away from peace and stillness and calmness is because we've forgotten the degree to which we're love. Mm -hmm. And if we can remember that we are love and we can make the movements in our lives that uphold that and that cultivate that and that honor that, that believe that even, um, it's a really, really good place to start. And I think everything else from there, if we're living in love, if we're hearing, speaking, and moving in love, um, and we're remembering that we are love, we're from love, and to love we return. And when I say love, it's in capital letters. Then this is the, the, the compass through which to navigate our way through these times. Well, thank you, Nicola, Christy, with love, with love. <clears throat> and uh, thank you, everyone that's uh, viewing this video and uh, uh, being able to experience Nicola Christie's wisdom and uh, most timely and vital insights. Blessings, everyone, and thank you from Frontier Theatre.